you are in for a treat today. You as a graduate student have been asked, well let us say told, that you're going to have to do one or maybe even two presentations about your project for the entire department. Well, today we're going to try to give you the best guidance we can on how to do a really impactful, high quality performance of your research. So today let's have a discussion about how to prepare and deliver scientific presentations. I want to note that there are many different kinds of presentations that you might do, and we're going to start by discussing some of those various types before we get uh, into the talk preparation itself. Next, we need to talk about how you go from your ideas to a set of slides that are going to uh, tell your story very well, to convey the narrative of your project. And finally, we'll discuss how you can deliver that talk in style. So, not just what is the point of the presentation, but also how do we create slides, craft slides for that presentation, and how we deliver them. We're going to discuss a variety of, of different styles, but um, I just want to note that different rules may apply for different kinds of talks that you might give. The ones that we'll be emphasizing today are proposals and reports. So in the proposal, we need to be able to convince others that we are prepared to take on this project, right? So the, the proposal is, is um, basically a confidence-building exercise to show the rest of the department that you've really thought through the issues of the research. A project report, on the other hand, is much more about conveying the gist of, the, of what you learned in the course of the several experiments. So proposals and reports are really common types of, student, of, of presentations for us to ask students to deliver. Now, if you're a new professor, you would probably rather hear a, a lecture about lectures. How do you div give a high-quality uh, lecture that can fit into part of a department's curriculum, for example? That will not be the subject of today. You're on your own hook, I'm sorry. Uh, and it, it's also worth noting that we as scientists have got to be better at discussing our research and its meaning with the public. And for that, discussions, uh, uh, sessions like Pint of Science and other kinds of interactions with the public are SCICOM, or science communication possibilities. Again, this talk will not be emphasizing those topics, but these are all common types of presentations for scientists to do. Now, for a proposal, I've borrowed criteria that the NIH uses, the National Institutes of Health in the United States, will use to determine who scores well or who scores poorly in a proposal. And you might think, well, why am I using these criteria? These relate to grants, and grants are these big piles of paper, etc. But in fact, that proposal may be in written form, a la a grant application, or it may be given verbally. You may be giving a verbal presentation to buttress an application, maybe a site visit or something. So in this case, you might be called upon to do your proposal in a, in a visual form. So the, it, frequently we find that honor students and, and masters and PhD students are called upon not just to talk about the results when the study is all done, but to instead talk about it midway to say, here's why we believe this is going to work. So let's talk about these different factors significance. Obviously, if you're going to uh, undergo a course of research, it's going to cost time, and it's going to cost money, and it may cost the lives of research animals, or it may have uh, private uh, data from patients in, in play. As a result, you have this, this criterion to, to meet the, um, the significance threshold, that undertaking this research matters, that it's going to have some sort of impact. Now, if you're working in something like tuberculosis research and you live in South Africa, that significance barrier is a pretty easy one to reach. There are lots of people who suffer from the disease tuberculosis. If our disease, if our research rather, can translate into something that makes their lives better, we've met the significance criterion. So these are the, the kinds of things that we would address in explaining the significance. And you frequently find that the very first part of a proposal talk is all about significance. To say, so many million people a year suffer from this disease, if this is true, then we could make this aspect of their life better. Right, so uh, that's significance. Now, investigator. On an NIH proposal, the PI of the grant, the principal investigator of that grant, is the person who gets scored on investigator. So you might think, oh, this is all about the professor again. It's not. If you are proposing your line of research, you are, in fact, the investigator for this. 
The people in the audience at a proposal talk are evaluating whether you, as a new, grad, as a, a new scientist, as, as a graduate student, are capable of carrying out the course of action you've described. So, you as an investigator are part of what's getting evaluated here. Not just have you chosen a problem that's significant, but are you yourself equipped to carry it out? Innovation is always going to be with us in science, and this is because um, we need to establish that we're not simply covering ground that's been covered a million times before. You know, let us say that you want to uh, run a genome-wide association study to discover which alleles in humans make people most likely to develop breast cancer. This work has been done over the space of decades. We don't need a new study to run a bunch of microarrays on a bunch of, of humans to say who, who of them is most likely to develop breast cancer. So we should always be not cognizant of the fact that our science is being evaluated on whether or not it brings something new, novel, to the table. Innovation is the score that reflects that. All right. So from there, we have approach. You can think of this as a score on your methods section. Is your approach well considered? Is it, is it reasonable? Is it appropriate to accomplish what you're setting out to do? If you set out to cure tuberculosis as your research goal, no method is going to be well-reasoned and appropriate because there's no one line of research that is guaranteed to just knock, knock out tuberculosis for the rest of time or knock out cancer for the rest of time. So um, approach needs to be reasonable to the goals that this research implies. If you present your work in a way that suggests you don't really know that much about the technology you're going to employ, say you're giving a, a, a project proposal in RNA-seq and you really have no notion how RNA-seq differs from microarrays, you're going to cause people to question your approach, even though the approach itself might be reasonable, you haven't evinced that you understand it well. So these aspects are something that we must be mindful of. Can we talk about what we're doing in a way that shows we understand what those methods entail? And finally, environment. Yes, your, your principal investigator who, who runs the lab has put together some sort of project outline and you as a graduate student have decided, yes, that sounds like an interesting thing to do. But the environment in which that ex series of experiments will take place is still under evaluation in this proposal stage. Why is it that your investigator's lab is the right place to do this kind of research? You know, maybe I'm really interested in COVID-19, right? That the new virus is sweeping the world, the pandemic that is killing thousands and thousands of people. And yet, does it make sense for David Tabb to suddenly launch a project in COVID-19? What expertise do I have in the space of virology? Have I ever taken a class in virology? Did I get a PhD in virology? Have I published papers in virology? And I gotta say, it's been 20 years since I took a class in virology. I may not be the optimal person to push a project like that out of my lab. As a result, the environment in which you work is certainly going to be an issue. Okay, so all of these things are, are topics that we want to satisfy our audience about as we do a research proposal. Now, if you're doing a report, you're really coming to the conclusion of a project. Maybe it's the end of the funding cycle, or maybe you're an honor student for one year, and here you've come up on the end of the year. Maybe the, the month of uh, October or November has rolled around. It's time for you to say, this is what we learned. This is what we learned, however, is quite a different kind of talk than here's what we propose to do. So a proposal is, is one, uh, one bookend for the shelf, and the other side of it is the, the final report. So, um, that could be a long document that you've created, but you're still going to need to translate that long document into something that you can present for your department. So, a proposal lays out the case for the new understanding that you've established in the course of that project. A lot of people make the mistake that a project report should be the complete record of everything they tried along the way. It's not. You're trying to build a narrative toward what you've learned. That does not include all of the, the wandering little blind alleys that you took along the way. All projects run into barriers. So making, making, this, uh, making this sound like some sort of Sisyphean task is probably not the right kind of course for you to take with a project report. So summarize the progress that you made towards your aims. 
In a year like 2020, when everybody's dealing with pandemic woes, it's going to be the case that lots of projects did not accomplish as much in the lab as they hoped to. So, progress towards AIM is something that we need to summarize. We need to be able to describe both positive and negative results. Maybe you set out in a cohort versus cohort study to say which genes changed in their expression between these two cohorts. And it may be that you did the experiment, but none of the genes produced a significant p-value once you adjusted for multiple testing correction. This happens, and that represents a negative result. It may be that that negative result has an impact on the, the aim that you were trying to evaluate. So, positive and negative results both may fit in the, in the course of a project report. It is always appropriate to talk about what kinds of scientific outputs resulted from a project. Now, if you were at a company, you would probably be very, very excited about the set of patents that were produced by a project. Sometimes in academia, we lose track of stuff like that and say it's just not important. But in fact, a patent is a very important kind of intellectual property output. But we also have things like papers. Did, did we submit a paper, a manuscript, for peer-reviewed publication as part of this? Were we able to turn our literature review into a review, review manuscript for submission? That would be an appropriate kind of publication to talk about. Uh, and we've also got what presentations did you do? If you've been to a presentation outside your department, say a regional uh, bioinformatics meeting or a regional genetics meeting to, to showcase your work, that is an output and something that we like to track. So by all means, mention it in your, in your final report. But it's also true that we may have other products that we're making available to the research community. This could be things like biological constructs. Maybe you've created a type of plasmid that other labs could benefit from that took you a while to get uh, 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 synthesized. Uh, perhaps you have some data sets that you generated, maybe mass spectrometry, maybe sequencer experiments, and maybe you created some algorithms. Maybe they're just scripts, but sometimes even a script can be very, very useful to other people who are trying to reproduce your work. So these outputs are also something that you're sharing as part of your research report. So look at how the experiments added to our understanding. Don't just try to say, I worked really hard. That's not an impressive story. How we changed our understanding is an important scientific narrative. All right, now I want to showcase a way in which the data that we represent as part of our proposal and the data that we present in the report can differ from, from each other. In this case, uh, I wanted to give three sentences that might appear in the course of a, uh, a project proposal versus what appears in a project report. These data show the proof of concept for this technology to be applied in this context. So maybe nobody has used RNA-seq in the context of a particular type of infection. In that case, um, a proof of concept experiment, a pilot experiment, might be very valuable to show that yes, RNA-seq are a relevant way to attack a certain problem. Right? So that proof of concept is one of these terms that shows up in a proposal. Similarly, preliminary data from our pilot project help us estimate technical variability. Well, that sounds like a very specific thing to do, but think of it this way. If you run the same sample through your technology three times, are you going to get identical results each time? You're not. You're going to get slightly different uh, measurements. Uh, whether you're pushing it through sequencing, pushing it through a mass spectrometer, or pushing it through a, a Western blot. So understanding how much variability you see, even when the sample has no change in it, is important. And, very importantly, this is part of the information we need in order to, to do a proper power calculation. And power calculations are one of the most powerful things that you can showcase in a proposal to show that your experiment is powered to, to uncover the kinds of phenomena that you're going in search of. Okay, so those are the kinds of sentences that you would see in a project proposal. In a project report, you're more likely to see ways in which the data set is complete. The experiments have been finished, they've been concluded, now the data have been finalized. So the experiments provided the information required to test our hypothesis. Remember that as scientists, we should at least, in general, have some notion of what scientific 
assumption, uh, well, assumption, what sort of um, assertion about uh, science we're trying to evaluate, that our experiments should give us the ability to say yes or no, that assertion um, was substantiated by the data, or that assertion was overturned by the data. But that's something that you'll know when the series of experiments is complete. Okay, so that's a difference in how the data we've collected can be described in these two different kinds of talks, in proposals versus reports. All right, so now we've talked a fair bit about what kinds of talks exist, specifically the proposal and the, and the final report, but now it is time for us to talk about how we can craft quality slides. We're not going to use tools like that, but I thought that they were a very vi vivid image. All right, so I would like you to remember that any time you craft a talk, you are working to have a concise talk and you're working to have one that meets the KISS principle. Now down here at the bottom I've, I've included the, uh, the words keep it short and simple. Keep it short and simple. You should always aspire to use uh, brevity and, uh, and of course simplicity in trying to communicate your ideas. Don't be simplistic, don't make, it, uh, um, don't make broad generalizations that can't really be evaluated, but, but use a compact explanation of your experiments and use one that's expressed in language that a, a wide, scientifically trained audience can understand. That's different if you're doing a pint of science, right? If you're doing a pint of science meeting, you're doing science communication, you're not talking to an audience that's trained in your field, and therefore things like, what is RNA-seq, are going to be much more necessary for you to describe. All right, so concise. Now, concise is a term that I first encountered Sheesh, I would have been in middle school, I think, and uh, our teachers made a big deal about defining it for us. And I, I've, I've noticed in this case that Oxford, Merriam-Webster, and American Heritage Dictionaries have all given us slightly different takes on what this term means, so I've chosen to include all three. Giving a lot of information clearly, and in a few words. Brief, but comprehensive. So it's got to be as short as possible, but long enough to cover the subject. It should be marked by the brevity, the, the briefness, of expression or statement. It must be free from all elaboration and superfluous detail. So elaboration means going into lots and lots of detail. We don't need to do that in a talk. We don't have time to do so. And superfluity, going above and beyond to uh, cover additional add-ons that don't really fit into the fundamental picture, those are things that we need to push aside as well. Expressing much in a few words, clear and succinct. Succinct is another great word to use. So if you, can, if you can achieve a concise presentation, you have one that's much more likely to be memorable. Going into uh, to jamming every second full of just as many ideas as possible is not actually a good communication strategy. I, I wish all professors knew that one too. All right. Now, slides should complement you. Your voice, what you're saying, should be complemented by the slides, but, wait, you're not paying attention to what I'm saying. You're looking at the cat. <sighs> all right, look, slides are intended to support me. I don't want you paying all your attention to the slides and ignoring me over here using my voice and waving my arms and so on, right? So be careful that your slides are not competing with you, right? So this is our cat. Her name is Mango, just so you know. All right. So, remember that a complex figure, or having lots of text on the screen, will mean that your audience is staring at the screen, trying to figure out what this visual represents. So, that's not what you want. You need to, you need to have your story as complete as possible, but as simple as possible. And having some, you know, four-part panel figure on slide is going to be very difficult for people to untangle as you speak. Every time you change a slide, your audience is going to drift away from your voice for a moment and look at what the slide has become. So, if you're changing slides every 20 seconds, you have a really big problem because your audience is so busy trying to keep up with, going, with, with what's going on in their visual field that you just vanish. You just vanish. So, this is one of the reasons why people argue you should have no more than two slides in a minute. Um, I, I, I think that's absolutely ridiculous. For my part, I cannot deliver 30 slides in an hour. And I've been speaking for a long time. 
So I, I really want to urge everybody to try to keep the slide count just as small as possible, but to cover as much of the topic as necessary. I want to note that you want to be really careful about having a naked figure out here. This figure with no caption on it is worrisome. Where did this come from? Did I scan that out of National Geographic? Did I use copyrighted material without a citation? That's very bad. So always try to remind people where your figure came from when uh, on the same slide as you present it. This slide should never exist. You have got to be very careful that in choosing background images for your slide, you have not rendered your text completely invisible. Oh, here, yes, I've got a great context, right? A, a great contrast. I have a, a dark background and light characters. So that's great, isn't it? That is not sufficient. Here we have all of these weird little uh, stars showing up all over the place, creating their own, um, their own impact on the image. So the background here has, become, has pushed itself right into the foreground. This image came from uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, actually. So I, I want to note here that I've got some fonts here that are pretty glaringly big. I use a lot of really large fonts when I present. But I've seen people use text like this down here. Did you even notice that there was a line of 16-point font here? The background makes this almost invisible to people, so just don't do this. You can use something other than a white background. That's not what I'm saying. But, but be very careful that your background doesn't crowd out the information you're trying to put in the foreground. I would also warn you against using a lot of tables in your slides. In this example, I'm using kind of a classic data set on iris sepal length that uh, shows up in a lot of data science talks. So here we have three different species, and here we're comparing, in this table, the length of the sepal leaves. So we, we can see that uh, the minimum here was 4.9, and the maximum is 7.9, and we've got the medians, and we've got the quartiles, etc. This is very instructive. This is a five-point analysis to tell us the distribution of sepal lengths. But it's a table, and our brains just don't work that well for immediately envisioning what, those, uh, what these numbers mean. This is why we have graphing. In this case, I'm showing a jitter plot shown on top of a box plot. This is something that we've produced other videos to uh, uh, teach people how to do. And instead of, of showing the five-point analysis for these species, I'm showing where all the data points actually are. In this case, in the first second you saw this slide, you said, gosh, the blues are bigger than the greens, are bigger than the, uh, the reds. That information was immediately visible to you, and in a way that you'd have to stare a long time at this table to untangle. Use graphs. It's what they're for. You, it may be that you have found that Although tools like PowerPoint are very, very widespread and are installed on most of the Windows computers around us, that, that it just it leaves you feeling a bit raw. That PowerPoint doesn't excite you, it, it creates what tend to be pretty flat visuals, and you'd like to use something else. There are options for this. One of the splashiest ones that you see is called Prezi. This is, this is software that's available at a charge. Um, but it creates some really dynamic transitions. As you move from one slide to the next, you can see the, the camera sort of sliding from one to the next. You may tell it that you want to zoom in very closely because you've hidden a figure um, you know, inside the letter E, and so now you just dive in on a word that contains the letter E, and there's your figure right in the middle. It's, it's dynamic and exciting. It is also possible to make people feel a little seasick if you use Prezi in a, in a bad way. So we have to be careful in, in what power we're given by these tools. Keynote is very widely used. Certainly if you're a Mac user, Keynote is one of the tools that's likely to recommend itself to you. Um, I note that there are tools even on Windows platforms for playing back um, Keynote uh, slides. So that's, that's a really good bit of news. It may be that you have an iPod that you, uh, sorry, iPad that you take with you on a trip and you want to continue making edits just on your iPad. Keynote is going to support stuff like that. So it's a really nice dynamic system for people who are on the go. It may be that you're um, already a big user of a tool like Google Drive to store shared documents, and the Google Slides tool lets you create slides in a, in a Google native environment. So anytime you make a change to your slides in a, a web browser on one computer, if you log into that document on another computer, the change is right there waiting for you. So Google Slides is very powerful for stuff like that. 
May I add something? Sure. If you use Google Slides, it does not add any, um, it doesn't take away any data from your Google Drive. They're free to the drive. Oh, that's lovely. Okay, so yes, so the space isn't going to count against your quota. That's also a very valuable trait. And finally, it may be that you're busily doing statistical or mathematical work. And frequently, we find that people who are doing a lot of that type of work are familiar with the LaTeX language. LaTeX is really, really powerful for, uh, for visualizing equations, etc. And helpfully, the LaTeX Beamer class has been created to make it very easy to create um, basically uh, scripts that are rendered as slides for you to use on screen. So it's a very powerful environment. If you are f a fan of LaTeX, definitely using Beamer to uh, re represent those on screen is a good idea. Don't forget, of course, that you might have a tool that you really, really love for making slides, but if your if you're a principal investigator on the grant can't read those slides um, or edit them on his or her computer, that can be a real slowdown for getting edits back. So always keep in mind that you need to have some buy-in from others around you if you choose to use your own route for producing slides. I have two opinions here, and I'm going to present them, but I want you to remember that this is not uniformly believed among professors. These are, these are things that cause my eyebrows to twitch, and so I'm presenting them. You can take them or you can leave them. I'm going to argue that you must use animation sparingly. I'm also going to argue that you should never ever count on an embedded video in your presentation. These are things that set my teeth on edge. Why is that? Let's start with the animation thing. I think a lot of people tend to call these builds, that you start with basically a title on the slide, you click, and the first bullet point comes sliding out, you click, the second bullet point comes sliding out, you click, the third bullet point comes sliding out. Easy, right? It's, it's, the, it's not the 90s anymore, we're, we're in a new dynamic age, we should use transitions and animations. Fine. But, I would note that if you do this too much, it really starts looking like a gimmick. And people are looking at the big gaping white space left on your screen and saying, okay, well they're going to have to float in another three or four things before this slide is actually done. Yes, some people are that cynical and crude. So, um, some people are not going to take it well if they have to wait for click, click, click for the rest of the slide to build out. They want to see a slide at a time. It is also plausible that you reach your question and answer session and need to back up to slide number five out of 20. If you have all these builds in there, each of them adds another click to backing up. So instead of clicking once and you're on slide 19, once and you're on slide 18, once more and you're on slide 17, you're having to click, 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 as you try to reverse all of this animation that you've built onto each slide. It's irritating. Let's talk about videos. It's a great idea, of course, that you've created a nice MP4 file that's a video you want to show to people. You, you're really proud of it. You took it through your microscope. It's glorious. But what happens if you embed that thing? It may be that you assume that video will play back on the computer where your talk happens just because it, it, it worked on your desktop workstation in the lab. But the software uh, for video playing that you have on your lab computer is different than the player you have at the, the podium. As a result, your, the, the video uses a codec that isn't loaded into the podium computer, and now you play back the, the, the video and you get a big blank square. Nothing's going on. Stuff like this happens all the time. The video equipment, uh, the video software and codecs that are installed on computers differ widely. You cannot anticipate that they're all going to work interchangeably. Technical issues show up every time that I see anybody doing an embedded video. I realize that's a generalization. That's because it's a generalization. In general, when I see people relying on embedded video, they inevitably have to go dig up a flash drive out of their backpacks and plug it into the computer and then try to play back that video on site. This technical issue time just leaves your audience fuming. Why weren't they better prepared, is what they're thinking. If you have to rely on this, test it, test it, test it on the computer where it's going to happen that day. All right. So, the other thing is that your PowerPoint file is going to grow. If you have to mail a PowerPoint file to somebody else and it's 25, 25 
gigs. <laughs> That's the problem, isn't it? I mean, uh, it, even a small amount of video is much bigger than the rest of your PowerPoint file. So why, why cause this structure to labor under that much added data? It's much more sensible to just leave it as a separate file for playback. Okay, so both of these are particularly problematic in today's pandemic because all of us are doing presentations remotely. And let me say that if I have a transition that's really amazingly animated from slide four to slide five, let's say that slide four suddenly looks like a baseball hit in the middle and it shattered into a bunch of little fragments and they all spin around and when they come back together, it's slide five. It's amazing, right? But what do my viewers see in a, in a presentation offered on Microsoft Teams or Skype or Zoom or whatever? What they see is maybe the first and maybe the last and a bunch of garbage in the middle because the bitrate can't keep up with your animation. Or if you're trying to play a video on an individual computer, how many frames a second are they going to see versus what you see? That is a worrisome thing. Better to just send everybody to the same uh, YouTube link where they can at least are downloading the video independently of each other. Okay, so things to think about. If I had a dime for every time somebody said, but it looked fine on my computer, well, I would, I would just not work in science anymore because this happens all the time. Learn in advance whether the, presenting, the, the presentation equipment you're using is widescreen or square. If, I would just point out that in this case, I've used a template for these slides that is square or it has a, an aspect ratio of four by three. But this television is an HDTV. It has a, a, an aspect ratio of 16 by 9. As a result, you have these big black blocks on either, either side of the screen. So I'm demonstrating how not to do it. If, if you match your slide template to the, the place where you're doing the presentation, you'll be a lot better off. Not all projectors are widescreen. Not all projectors are narrow screen. Find out in advance. These days, if you do your presentation on a Mac and play it back on a PC, it's probably going to look all right. Probably. But there are some circumstances under which uh, certain types of inclusions, like um, vector art or QuickTime files or things like that, don't, uh, don't transfer correctly from Mac to PC. It's very, very much a good idea to create a PDF, uh, an Acrobat file of your, uh, of your presentation to play back because that way at least you're pretty much guaranteed that the, the fonts and so on are going to transfer over correctly. Weird things happen when we convert from one software's format to another. Do not assume that just because you did your thing in Keynote on a Mac that you're going to be able to dump out a PowerPoint file that, that looks perfect on a Windows machine in the other room. This is not something you can guarantee. Arrive early, test on that machine that all the di different parts of your presentation look right. Stand and deliver. I learned something really interesting while writing this talk. The phrase stand and deliver does not mean be bold and deliver proudly. It's actually a term that could be used by a highwayman. If you're riding in your carriage from one medieval village to another and a, a highwayman shows up and brandishes a pistol and shouts, ah, stand and deliver, they're saying your money or your life. <laughs> so um, in the old days, it might be that somebody was going to harass you. And I have to say, there are a lot of graduate students who, when told we're going to have you give a talk, feel like they've been threatened. So stand and deliver really can be a little, uh, it can be an appropriate phrase for you're going to give a talk. But I would rather uh, think about um, uh, Jacinda Ar Ar Ardern from, uh, uh, from New Zealand. Look how comfortable she is here. Do you think she would rather have a good PA system and so on and speak into a nice light microphone and, and, and so on? She's not worried about the fact that she's having to deliver this speech through a bullhorn. That's the kind of chutzpah you need to be a good speaker. To, to let the environment be what it's going to be, you're going to get your message across. So what I'm hopeful about is that the practice of giving talks as a graduate student is going to fill you with the confidence that you can do this. And the answer is, you can. You can be like this person who's able to present under adverse circumstances and still do it with a smile. How do you get there? 
There are a lot of keystones, and I don't feel like I can communicate all of them, but I'm, I'm going to try to put together the biggest principles that make public speaking feasible. Connection. Are you able to engage with your audience? This is a very big one. So connection, a, a strong sense of connection with the people you're talking to will take away from this feeling like you're a, a bug under a searchlight, you know? You are in communication with your audience and having a good engagement with them is something that's going to allow you to speak more fluidly. Projection. Can your listeners hear you? This is a very big deal. We're going to talk about some of the most common mistakes that occur in this space. Ownership. This is not one you're going to hear in most presentations, but I feel that it's, it, we have to say it. Is your personal investment in this work apparent? Are you, are you just saying what your advisor told you to say, or have you personally taken responsibility for seeing this thing succeed? That is a tough point. Ownership is something that needs to come across when you give your presentations. And finally, respect. Oh, Respect is something I care about an awful lot, and we're going to get to that in a few slides, but is your use of time and the level of detail appropriate for this particular audience in this particular setting? This is a big deal, so we'll come to that in a minute. Rule one. Keep your eyes on your audience. One of the reasons why filming a lecture at home is so jarring for me is that there's not a crowd of seats, as far as the eye can see, packed with people wrapped in attention. It's different talking to a camera than it is to talk to an audience. So the number one peril is that you are going to shy away from your listeners and instead take refuge behind your slides. The way that this exhibits itself is somebody's reading their slides and they're not looking up at all. Oh my, oh my, that is a dangerous place. I want to remind you of uh, an odd little saying that appears on a bit of military equipment. Maybe you've never heard of a claymore mine, but uh, they, they are used as anti-personnel mines. Sorry, little military terminology here. But I want you to note that the, the mine has a side to it. It doesn't just blow out in all directions. It's intended to blow out in a particular field of fire and rake down a bunch of infantry. And so it clearly says on the packaging, front toward enemy. And it may be that in your very first talks, you say to yourself, I am terrified of public speaking. And it might seem like the audience is your enemy. Over time, that will get better. But I want you to remember that you must present your front toward your enemy, towards your, slide, uh, towards your audience. That is very much necessary. So don't take refuge in your slides. Build an, enga build an engagement with the audience. Eye contact is vital. So if your slides are where your eyes are, you're not looking at your audience. You're missing cues from people. Are people spending time on their iPhones or are they actually looking at you? I'll tell you this, if you look at them, they're much more likely to look at you. That is the scenario that you want. All right, so uh, on we go. It may help to chat with people. One of the first talks I did internationally was a, a trip across the border into Canada from the United States. And I was really, really excited about my talk. So excited, in fact, that I woke up at 3 a.m. that morning and I couldn't get back to sleep. I was completely jittery. And so at the talk, um, I took a few moments before the, the session began to talk with some people in the front row, to have conversations with them, to realize who they were, what level were they at, were they grad students like me, were they high and mighty professors, were they local, had they come across town, that sort of thing. That actually helped quite a lot for me to feel much more comfortable in that environment. If you arrive early, stuff like that's possible. All right. Um, Keep one foot pointed at your audience. This is kind of a, a, a little feature I learned from acting class. You know, if I turn my back to the camera and talk, all that sound is just vanishing right into the wall, and it's not coming to the camera. It helps tremendously if I'm able to keep one of my feet pointed with my toes at my audience. That means that even if I pivot to point at something on my slide, I'm going to come back here. By keeping this foot locked into place, 
I keep my pose open to the audience. That really does matter. Okay, so those are uh, some of the basic points on presentation. What are the most common things that we see people fouling up in doing the verbal aspect, the, the, the vocals of the, the presentation? First off, there are a lot of people who say, oh, I'm loud, I don't need a microphone. Don't be that person. Use the friggin' microphone. Yes, yes, use it. It, it, it might be that you're someone like me who likes walking around into the audience and so on and uh, interacting more closely with different parts of the audience at different times. In a case like that, get a portable microphone. But don't just try to bellow it all out from the, from the front of the room. People feel like they're getting shouted at. You don't want that. All right, so use the microphone. Next, project. Did you have an acting class when you were in high school? This is where those lessons come into play. Projecting means being able to fill the room around you with your sound. It's a lovely thing. But you're probably going to have to speak just a little bit more loudly. But again, we're not going for someone to yell at the whole room. What we're looking for is being able to project so that pe even the people in the back row of the room, the students who crept in late, are able to hear. All right, so being able to speak loudly enough that the sound is audible is important. What if I start out each sentence with a lot of excitement and so on, and then I finally wrap down to the final point of him, really? Well, that's not very good, is it? You need to be able to hear the whole sentence. You have to be mindful of your speech when you're giving a talk in such a way that the whole sentence is there for people to hear. Don't let your voice trail off at the end before you get to your final point. This is important for communication. Also, a lot of people, when a camera is on them, or they're standing in front of a crowd of people, start to speak really, really rapidly. And i got to say, there are a lot of people who are going to struggle to understand what you're saying if you speak at an incredibly quick uh, clip. So it's very important that we, we gain the ability to gauge whether people are understanding us. If I start speaking very quickly and excitedly, then I'm probably going to see some people in the, in the audience going, stretch it out. <laughs> To, to take your time, get your point across clearly. Handling questions is something that terrifies a lot of graduate students, and knowing how some professors behave, I can understand that, but I think it's useful to put together a few strategies that you can use to make your experience of answering questions more comfortable. So let's start with repeating or restating the question. In this case, it might be that somebody in the front row said quite conversationally uh, to me a question, and I could hear it, and the people in the front row could hear it, but the people at the back of the room had not a chance. Therefore, it's important for me, as the speaker, the person with the microphone, to repeat that question. Now, that's good on, a, on several fronts. First off, yes, we want everybody in the room to know what the question is. Secondly, it ensures that you understand it. Just taking a second or two to repeat the question gives you time to think about that question. It's very, very powerful. Because of that short delay, you're going to have a better response in mind by the time you come to begin answering the question, just by repeating it. Very easy exercise. Next. I'm going to give you a rule that was brought to me by uh, Mrs. Georgia Brady. Now, George Brady was my, I, I hesitate to call her Georgia because she was a high school teacher of mine. So Mrs. Brady is who she is forever, forevermore in my mind. Her rule was this. She taught the debate course, right? So don't try to answer the argument that was put in front of you by your opponent. Instead, put the best possible spin on the argument they made and answer that instead. So, if you are able to answer the best version of the question that somebody in the crowd asks you, you're likely to have a much more comprehensive kind of answer that is applicable to lots of questions in that area. So, it's, it's a good idea to try to figure out the best way that that question that was asked of you could be asked. All right, so that's the Brady rule. Finally, and this is a big one, do not turn to your advisor for answers in a project or a final year pro uh, project presentation. Some advisors, they just can't sit on their hands and stay out of it. Some advisors are gonna battle in there to try to answer every question, and heaven help them, you, 
I hope, you got to hope their colleagues will grab them and pull them back into their seats. You are the expert. You are the expert. As a result, if it's within your grasp to answer a question, answer it. If you have to work a little outside your area of comfort, answer it. If your advisor feels that you've totally muffed it and, and really feels that the audience needs to hear the correct, correct answer, perhaps he or she will then stand up and, and offer a, 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 a re-spin of your answer. But you don't want to get to that place. You're the expert. Take individual responsibility for what you are presenting. Think about what kinds of questions someone is likely to ask upon hearing your, your slides. Okay, so that brings us to the thing that causes me to, to get into a very bad place. Time is a limited resource. When you are speaking to your division, you have a group of people who are always upset about the number of things that they're supposed to accomplish in a given day, and they've been told that they have to hold this hour of, the, of each week just for the divisional presentation. They've agreed that they're going to do that, and that's grand. But there are frequently times when the presentations run much, much longer than they are supposed to go. If you are given 12 minutes to do a, a quick project proposal and you speak for 30 minutes, you're going to have some upset people. So let's think about three ways that this creates a problem. First off, do not vex the panel chair. If you have a senior professor who runs the graduate program, who is uh, trying to keep everything on time, and student A has been booked in for the first 20 minutes, and student B is booked in for the second 20 minutes, and so on, they're going to be very angry if one of those 20-minute blocks suddenly becomes a 30- or 40-minute block. Don't do that to yourself, because angry panel chairs are powerful. Next, do not force other speakers to rush. You know, if there are three speakers who are all going to share this hour, how does speaker two and three feel when speaker one runs over time? Now they're like, well, great. Now the thing that barely fit into 20 minutes, I've got to fit into 10 minutes. This is very, very bad behavior on your part. Don't do that to your peers. Do not ever hold your audience hostage. The people who've seen me get really angry at a student presentation hasn't been because of bad science or bad statistics. It's because a presentation that was supposed to fit in 20 minutes ran for 45. You know you're in trouble if the first question out of my mouth after you finish speaking is how many slides did you prepare for this session? Because that's a dead giveaway that I feel that you've done it badly. We feel it very important that you are respectful of time. Don't let this David be the one who shows up at your talk. Finally, uh, we talked a bit a moment about vexing your panel chair. I would just say that at some conferences, things like the hug rule have been brought into place, which is to say that if you run over your time, the person chairing the panel gets to come up on stage and hug you in front of the audience. This is not something you want to happen. There are also people who, um, who actually play sound clips to say, your time is up. Everyone in the room can see in some of these venues that the red light is flashing and that you've run over time and you're ignoring it. If the panel, if the panel chair has gone so far as to say time to you, what they're really saying is stop. So if that happens to you, go directly to your conclusion slide. Don't say, well, I have just this one thing. It'll take just a minute. Don't ever do that. If your panel chair has said it's time, it's time. Go to the last slide. Finish now. All right? Very, very important. I feel like this quote from uh, 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 Carl Buhner is, is a really important one because we frequently feel that getting technical details matters and how we do it doesn't. And this is a scientific blind spot, frankly. We need to do better at this. Your, your audience may forget what you said but they will never forget how you made them feel. If you're able to cause your audience to feel a sense of excitement at the research project you've put together, or excitement at what's been accomplished in the course of your year or two, you've accomplished something pretty amazing. Make them feel the excitement that you do for your work.
Lots of takeaway messages. Proposals establish the credibility of a plan. Project reports establish what new knowledge has been generated as part of it. So what type of talk you're doing is going to change the content of it. Explaining studies in a short talk requires paring down to just the essential points. And it means communicating them not just in a bunch of text, but visually. Finding ways to, to tell that visual story is a very, very, very big deal in making your story um, easily uh, taken on by new people. A speaker is there to captivate, not to read. Do not read your slides. The audience could read your slides without you being there. Add something to it by your performance of that presentation. Be responsible with time. It's all any of us have, ultimately. So be very cautious that when you present some, a, a slide in your talk, that it has a reason for being there. No one wants to hear you know, 60, 60 slides of erudition in 20 minutes. This is never going to work out well. So I hope that these hints have given you some thoughts on how you can make your presentation a little easier uh, for your audience to understand your point and to see how valuable you are as a growing scientist. Thank you.